Adventures in Negro History. The things I have just told you are true. Slavery is no good. I want to help, and, and I want to thank you for asking me to speak. Thank you. I, William Lloyd Garrison, ask you, have we been listening to a thing, a piece of property, or a man? Would you allow this man to be taken back into inhuman bondage? No! no. Will you help and protect him as a brother man, a resident of the old Bay State? Yes, yes. 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 We have just witnessed a legend in the making. This shy, halting speaker was Frederick Douglass, speaking before an abolitionist meeting in Nantucket, Massachusetts, on August the 12th of 1841. Frederick Douglass was one of the most significant Negroes this country has produced. He became a most eloquent critic of injustice and one of the most effective orators and molders of public opinion to be found during the turbulent 19th century. Shenandoah, I long to hear you away, rolling river. Oh, Shenandoah, I long to hear you away. I'm bound away. Across the wide Missouri. The dawn of the 19th century found America on the move. North and south, settlers were moving beyond the Alleghenies. The nation reflected a youthful vigor. Ohio, Mississippi, Illinois, Alabama, Missouri, and Maine became new states. The total United States population in 1800 was 5,308,000. There were slightly over 1 million Negroes, and of these, 108,000 were free. A number of Negroes had gained their freedom by fighting in the Revolutionary War. In fact, at no time in American history, even in its darkest hour, was the light of Negro freedom ever extinguished. Negro churches, schools, and fraternal organizations played a vital part in the lives of the free colored people in the North. And during the War of 1812, Negroes fought with Commodore Perry on the Great Lakes. Free Negroes and slaves fought with Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans. In 1814, James Fortin, Richard Allen, and Absalom Jones rallied a force of 2,500 colored volunteers to protect the city of Philadelphia from the British. American statesmen, including Henry Clay and President Monroe, were setting up the American Colonization Society with a view of sending free Negroes to Africa. And in a drab cabin, in the slave quarters of a Maryland plantation, a baby was born, whose future thoughts and colorful actions would become a powerful force in the raging current of American history. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Mm -hmm. Frederick Augustus Bailey was indeed a motherless child. He seldom saw his mother because she worked on a neighboring plantation. He was cared for by his grandmother. He soon realized that he and all the inhabitants of his little world belonged to some mysterious person called Old Master. 
and old master only allowed children to live with their grandmothers for a short time. At the age of eight, slave children were generally sent to Colonel Lloyd's plantation, where they were placed under the command of Aunt Katie. Under Aunt Katie's iron discipline, these children were readied for the drudgery of forced labor. It was in Aunt Katie's kitchen that Fred saw his mother for the last time. She had walked 12 miles in order to see him for only a few short minutes. She brought him a precious gift, a piece of gingerbread. Hush, my little baby, don't you cry. Mama's gonna be with you by and by. My poor baby, my poor hungry child. Lord, please take care of my child. Help him find a good master. Hush, my little baby, don't you cry. Mama's gonna be with you by and by. During the 1820s, the winds of political and social change were blowing everywhere in the young nation. New political parties were being formed. The first wave of Irish and German immigrants arrived on our shores looking for a better way of life. Many Indian tribes were moved across the Mississippi River in order to make room for settlers. The many slaves who were taken by their masters into Texas became the forerunners of the Negro cowboys, who later played an important part in the cattle drives eastward to the big markets after the Civil War. In Washington, President Monroe proclaimed the doctrine to protect our sister republics in the Western Hemisphere. The population of this young nation was almost 10 million, with only 2 million of its people living west of the Alleghenies. Andrew Jackson was elected president, and the age of the common man was ushered in. And John Russworm became the first of the Negro race to graduate from college in the United States. My name is John Russworm. I was graduated from Bowdoin College in 1826. In March of 1827, Samuel Cornish, a Negro Presbyterian minister, and I founded the first Negro newspaper, Freedom's Journal. Our newspaper firmly denounced slavery and advocated civil rights. Later, I became interested in Negro colonization and went to Liberia, and for a time, I was its Minister of Education. The Census Report of 1830 revealed that the population of the United States had reached 13 million, and of these, about one-fifth or two and a half million were Negroes. During this decade, the people of the North and South argued bitterly over the issues of slavery and freedom, and William Lloyd Garrison emerged as a dynamic force in the anti-slavery movement. Meanwhile, free Negroes continued to grasp for more individual freedom. And David Walker, a Negro businessman in Boston, wrote the bitterest indictment of slavery that had ever been published in America, Appeal in Four Articles. Certain colored religious organizations produced leaders who proclaimed the feelings of their brethren. One such spokesman was Richard Allen, who would help form the African Methodist Episcopal Church in 1794 and later became its first bishop. The formation of this church was a result of Negroes refusing to accept segregation in certain white churches in Philadelphia. Other early Negro religious groups were the African Baptist Church, founded in Boston in 1809 by Thomas Paul, and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, which was established in New York City in 1796 by Peter Williams and James Varick. During the year of 1830, a young Negro, Hezekiah Grice, became alarmed over the way the rights of free people of color were being disregarded. He went to Philadelphia to enlist the aid of Bishop Richard Allen. Grice proposed that a convention be called in order to come up with some organized plan by which Negroes could migrate to Canada or Africa or find ways and means of improving their lot in the country of their birth. On September the 30th, 
1830, Bishop Allen called for a meeting of the first National Negro Convention in Philadelphia at Bethel AME Church. Many free men of color were opposed to the idea of colonization as a cure for the problems of the free Negro. In 1831, at a mass meeting denouncing colonization, Philip A. Bell, a newspaper publisher and an advocate of Negro rights, said, We do not believe that things will always continue the same. The time must come when the Declaration of Independence will be felt in the heart as well as uttered from the mouth, and when the rights of all shall be properly acknowledged and appreciated. God hasten that time. This is our home, and this is our country. Beneath its sod lie the bones of our fathers. For it, some of them fought, bled, and died. Here we were born, and here we will die. Meanwhile, young Fred Bailey was growing up on Colonel Lloyd's Maryland plantation. The turning point in his life came when he was sent to live with Mr. and Mrs. Hugh Auld in Baltimore during the summer of 1825. Fred was only eight years old, and Mrs. Auld was kind to him. Having never owned slaves, she began teaching Fred to read, which greatly displeased Mr. Auld. If you give a slave an inch, he'll take a yard. Learning will spoil the best slave in the world. And if he learns to read the Bible, <laughs> it will forever unfit him to be a slave. But young Fred used many tricks in order to learn to read and write in his own ingenious way. He used his white playmates as teachers. Whenever he was sent on an errand or given time to play, he would seek out his playmates and have them go over their schoolwork with him. He had many free lessons that way. In 1832, Fred was sent back to St. Michael's, Maryland, where he was hired out to Edward Covey. Covey had a reputation of being a slave breaker. Slave breakers were like bronco busters out west. It was their job to break the spirit of young slaves in order to make them adjust to the harness of slavery. This was a turning point in young Fred's life. It caused him to dream of freedom and gave him a new sense of manhood. Fred eventually was sent back to live with the Alls in Baltimore, which greatly pleased him. You gotta fool this timber before that sun goes down. You get across that river before that boss comes round. You drag it on down that dusty road. Come on, Jerry, let's fool this load of hauling timber. Timber. Lord, this timber's got me. Hauling timber. Timber. Lord, this timber's got me. In many southern cities, slaves could hire themselves out, pay their masters a guaranteed weekly wage, and keep a little for themselves. As a result of this practice, a city slave had much more freedom than plantation slaves. Fred had such an agreement with Mr. All. This gave Fred an opportunity to go to camp meetings and associate with the free Negroes of Baltimore. In 1838, Baltimore had a population of around 95,000. Nearly every fourth Baltimore resident was a Negro, over 22,000 of them, 80% of whom were free. In the Negro community, there were 10 churches and 35 benevolent societies made up primarily of free Negroes, since slaves were not usually permitted to join such societies. However, Fred was a special member of the East Baltimore Improvement Society. It was there that he met Anna Murray. Frederick, how can I become your wife when you are still a slave? What kind of life would we have? I don't plan to be a slave long, Anna. With the help of the Lord, I'm going to escape. And we can marry up north. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? And why not every?
Fred obtained a sailor's uniform and protection papers from a friend. He arranged with Isaac Rowe, the wagon driver, to place his baggage on the train the moment it began to move. Seconds later, Fred boarded the train and took a seat in the colored section of the car. Suddenly, the conductor of the train approached Fred. I suppose you have your free papers. No, sir. I never carry my free papers to see with me. But you have something to show that you're a free man, have you not? Yes, sir. My seaman's papers that will carry me round the world. Satisfied, the conductor took his fare and quickly looked at his papers. The first test was the easiest. Fred had several narrow escapes before he reached Philadelphia and freedom. As he crossed the Susquehanna River, one of the deckhands on the ferry boat recognized him and unsuccessfully tried to question him. He also saw a German blacksmith and a ship's captain who knew him, but luckily did not recognize him in his disguise. Finally, as he traveled farther and farther north, Frederick Augustus Bailey realized that his plan had worked. He had escaped. He was free. The years between 1840 and 1850 were years full of turmoil and man's inhumanity to man. There were anti-Catholic riots in Philadelphia. And in Illinois, Joseph Smith, the leader of the Mormons, was lynched in 1844. Both the Baptist and Methodist churches split over the issue of slavery. The United States fought a war with Mexico and acquired more territory. And in 1849, gold was discovered in California and America moved farther west. We formed our band and we're all man, do da, do da, to journey afar to the promised land, do da, do da, day, where the golden ore is rich in store, do da, do da, on the banks of the Sacramento shore, do da, do da, day, then ho, boy, his ho, to California go, there's plenty of gold, so I've been told, on the banks of the Sacramento. After his escape in 1838, Fred Bailey acquired, along with his freedom, a new last name to hide his past. Now, he was Frederick Douglass. He promptly joined the ranks of the abolitionists, and his services were in great demand to answer the propaganda of the slave owners, who argued that slavery was beneficial to the Negro. Having been a slave himself, Douglass was uniquely equipped to refute the arguments of the slaveholders. Douglas traveled with this weary and dedicated band speaking nightly. He told his story well. And I say the whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions have been borne by struggle. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Negroes are a people chained together. We are one people. Every one of us should be ashamed to consider himself free while his brother is a slave. Experience proves that those are oftenest abused who can be abused with the greatest impunity. Men are whipped oftenest, who are whipped easiest. Douglas was acclaimed wherever he spoke. His majestic voice and manly bearing impressed all who heard him. Many Negroes responded to the challenges of the abolitionist era and emerged significant and effective leaders. Among them were James Fortin, Sojourner Truth, Samuel Ringgold Ward, Lunsford Lane, Charles Lennox Riemann, and James McCune Smith. 
Other unsung heroes who made important contributions were Charles Ray, William Wells Brown, Jermaine Wesley Logan, James W.C. Pennington, Robert Purvis, and Henry Highland Garnet. Garnet, who like Douglas was also an escaped slave, advocated the use of force in the overthrow of slavery. At the third National Negro Convention in August of 1843, which was held in Buffalo, New York, Garnet and Douglas held a bitter debate over the question of force to solve the problem of slavery. Brethren, forget not that you are native-born American citizens, and as such are justly entitled to all the rights granted to the freest. Think how many tears you have poured out upon the soil which you have cultivated with unrequited toil and enriched with your blood. And then go to your lordly enslavers and tell them plainly that you are determined to be free. Douglas and his rebuttal adopted a more moderate approach. However, Garnett's militant speech, entitled An Address to the Slaves of the United States, attracted national attention and came within one vote of being adopted as the sentiment of that convention. It was inconceivable to many that Frederick Douglass could be whom he said he was. It was difficult for them to understand how a man who had never gone to school and had been a slave until six years before could speak so well and be so profound. Douglas was aware of these feelings, and it caused him to make a very difficult decision. I know that they're saying that I'm an imposter and a fraud, and I have taken steps to silence those who call me these names. I have written the story of my life. I have named names, dates, and places. I must do this, or else my usefulness to the cause will diminish. In May of 1845, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass came off the press. This small volume of 125 pages contained introductions by the great abolitionists William Lloyd Garrison and Wendell Phillips and sold for 50 cents. It was an immediate success and was translated into French and German. Having exposed his slave past in his autobiography, Douglas fled to England to avoid the possibility of being taken back into slavery. Douglas traveled throughout Ireland, Scotland, and England. He met and was entertained by the great and near great of the British Isles. He made many speeches and became a celebrity. His English friends raised enough money to buy his freedom and to help him start a newspaper called The North Star. In his final speech before leaving England in 1847, Frederick Douglass said, I do not go back to America to sit still, remain quiet and enjoy ease and comfort. I glory in the conflict that I may hereafter exult in the victory. I know that victory is certain. Frederick Douglass had left the United States as a refugee and a piece of property in the eyesight of the law. He returned to the land of his birth, a free man and a world figure. After his return to America, Douglas discovered that his freedom, which had been purchased, was not enough to ensure his safety. He and all other free Negroes found their freedom in jeopardy with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850. This law gave slaveholders and federal law enforcement officers the right to return escaped slaves from any part of the United States to their former masters. No longer could the Underground Railroad stop in the north but had to carry its passengers on into Canada. Follow the drinking gourd, follow the drinking gourd, for the old man is a waiting for to carry you to freedom if you follow the drinking gourd. 
Well, the river bank makes a mighty good road. The dead trees will show you the way. On the left foot, big foot, traveling on, follow the drinking gold. Mm-hmm. Found us out there, Harriet. They found us. Keep on moving. They ain't caught us yet. Harriet, I'm going back. I'm going to give myself up. I know we couldn't get away. This here gun says we're going to keep on. Now, hush up and run. All right. Harriet Tubman's activities greatly impressed Frederick Douglass, who himself helped an average of eight runaways a month. In a letter, he once wrote to her, Most that I have done has been in public. And I've received much encouragement. You, on the other hand, have labored in a private way. I have had the applause of the crowd, while the most that you have done has been witnessed by a few trembling, scared, and footsore bondsmen. The midnight sky and the silent stars have been the witnesses of your devotion to freedom and of your heroism. Follow the drinking gold. The Underground Railroad was operated by Quakers, free Negroes, and all kinds of people with anti-slavery sentiments. In areas which were inaccessible to this established route, many slaves escaped into the Western territories and into Mexico often aided by the Indians. The president of the Underground Railroad was Levi Coffin. It is estimated that he was aided and abetted by over 3,200 active workers. One of the most daring conductors on the line was John Fairfield, the son of a wealthy Virginia slaveholding family. He posed as a slaveholder, a Negro trader, and he used all manner of disguises to carry out his escape plots. His most famous flight occurred when he organized 28 slaves into a funeral procession, all of whom escaped. The river ends between two hills, follow the drinking cord. For the old man is waiting for the carrier to freedom, if you follow the drinking cord. Well, the river bank makes a mighty good road. The dead trees will show you the way. On the left foot, big foot, traveling on. Follow the drinking gold. During the 1850s, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was published. William Wells Brown became the first Negro in America to write a play and a novel when he wrote the novel Clotel in 1853, and the play The Escape in 1859. John B. DeGrasse, a Negro physician, was admitted to the Massachusetts Medical Society. Ashman Institute in Pennsylvania, which later became Lincoln University, was founded in 1854 by the Presbyterian Church. And Wilberforce College in Ohio was established by the Methodist Church in 1856 and was later sold to the AME Church. During the 1850s, the Dred Scott case was argued before the Supreme Court. The rendered decision ruled that slavery was legal in federal territories and Negroes had no rights of citizenship. The controversial Kansas-Nebraska Act caused a bloody war between anti- and pro-slavery forces in Kansas. And out in Illinois, an unknown prairie lawyer named Lincoln emerged a national figure. Frederick Douglass and the fiery John Brown met in 1848 and began a friendship which lasted until Brown's death. Both men were unyielding foes of slavery. However, they did not agree upon the method of ridding the country of this curse. They once met at a deserted stone quarry in Pennsylvania in August of 1859. Brown was a hunted man at this time. Douglas, I plan to seize the government arsenal at Harper's Ferry and hold it. But such an attack upon the federal government will lead only to disaster for you and your band. No. No amount of argument can change my mind. Look, 
I am more than willing to help slaves run away on the Underground Railroad. But this naked use of force against the government is fatal folly. Come with me, Douglas. I will defend you with my life. I want you for a special purpose. When I strike, the bees will begin to swarm and I shall want you to help me hive them. I'm truly sorry, my friend, but I cannot support you in this venture. I... I wish you well. On October the 17th, 1859, while John Brown was attacking Harper's Ferry in Virginia, Douglas was in Philadelphia speaking at National Hall. When Douglas heard the news, he became alarmed and hurried home to Rochester, New York. Although he was innocent, Douglas was accused of being an accomplice in the Harper's Ferry plot. Once again, Douglas was forced to flee. First he went to Canada and finally to England. He thought that this would be a lifetime of exile from the country that he loved, but did not love him. His heart was heavy as he sailed from Quebec to England on November 12, 1859. And then, Douglas received a sad letter from his wife in America. My dearest husband, our little girl is dead. Annie is dead. She, more than any of us, felt your absence the most. She grieved so much for you until she became ill. She slowly lost her hearing and speech. And last night, she died. The one you call the light of your life in your house is gone. Oh, Frederick. Frederick Douglass was inconsolable with grief and immediately returned to America. Upon his arrival in America, Douglass discovered that the hysteria involving the John Brown raid had died down, but the North and South seemed to be on a collision course, and only a miracle could save them. On the eve of the Civil War, Southern legislatures declared that they had a legal right to secede from the Union, and they considered Abraham Lincoln a threat to their way of life. When Lincoln was elected president, they withdrew to form their own Confederate States of America. The head-on collision occurred at Fort Sumter on April the 12th, 1861, when the Confederates fired upon the fort. This war is being fought to save the Union. This war is being fought to preserve our state's rights and the Southern way of life. This war is fought because men are proud fools. I pray that out of this, the poor, poor slaves may eventually be free. During the summer of 1862, rumors spread throughout the country that President Lincoln was considering emancipating the slaves. Old Abe will never free the slaves because Maryland, Kentucky, and Delaware might join the Confederates. Abraham Lincoln may be slow, but he is not a man to reconsider, retract, and contradict words and purposes solemnly proclaimed over his official office. On January 1st, 1863, expectancy and doubt were in the air. The great question was, will he or will he not sign the final draft of the Emancipation Proclamation? People who had looked forward to this day dared not speak of it for fear that it was an illusion and the spell might pass. However, in the North, many people went about making preparations to celebrate. The largest celebrations for the Emancipation Proclamation were held in Boston. That afternoon, many of the country's leading literary figures met at Boston's Music Hall. John Greenleaf Whittier, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and Harriet Beecher Stowe were there. 
The Philharmonic Orchestra played Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and Ralph Waldo Emerson read his Boston Hymn, a poem written for this occasion. I break your bonds and master ships, and I unchain the slave. Free be his heart and hand henceforth as wind and wandering wave. That evening, Douglas, his friends, and a crowd of 3,000 met in Tremont Temple in Boston, Massachusetts. Simultaneously, all over the North, in churches and humble meeting places, Negroes and their friends were growing more anxious by the minute. Eight, nine. Ten o'clock came, and still no word. It chilled their hopes and strengthened their fears. Finally, someone rushed forward. Hear me! We just got the news on the telegraph. Mr. Lincoln's done freed the slaves! Oh, 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 shouted for joy, and others fell silently to their knees in prayers of thanksgiving. From the beginning of the war, Douglas had constantly urged the government to use Negro troops in the Union Army. It seems extremely proper that the descendants of Africans should take a prominent part in a war which will eventually lead to a general emancipation of their race. I think that at least one fine regiment could be raised from colored men in the North and East. In January of 1863, the War Department allowed Governor Andrews of Massachusetts to form a Negro regiment, the 54th Massachusetts. Since there were not enough Negro men in Massachusetts to make up a full regiment, George L. Stearns, a wealthy abolitionist, formed a committee to recruit additional troops. Douglas, William Wells Brown, Charles L. Riemann, John Mercer Langston, Henry Highland Garnett, and Martin Delaney served as recruiting agents and traveled all over the North and Canada. Later, Martin Delaney himself joined the Army and rose to the rank of Major. Meanwhile, William N. Reed, who had been educated in Germany, gallantly led the 1st North Carolina Regiment and, as a Lieutenant Colonel, was the highest ranking officer in the United States Colored Troops. Douglas, by now too old to serve in the army himself, made a valuable contribution by writing and speaking and molding public opinion. His sons, Lewis and Charles, were among the first Negroes to enlist in the army. Lewis fought in the battle of Fort Wagner in South Carolina in 1863. In a letter to Miss Amelia Logan, he told of that battle. My dear Amelia, I have been in two fights and am unhurt. I'm about to go into another, I believe, tonight. Our men fought well on both occasions. The last was desperate. We charged that terrible battery on Morris Island, known as Fort Wagner, and were repulsed. I escaped unhurt. My thoughts are with you often. You are as dear as ever. Negro troops played an important part in the final Union victory. By the fall of 1864, there were 140 Negro regiments. 15 served in the Army of the James and 23 in the Army of the Potomac. During the years of 1864-1865, Negro troops fought in every major campaign except for Sherman's invasion of Georgia. It was estimated that 38,000 colored troops gave their lives for freedom. After the Civil War, 
The South's most pressing problem was survival. Her government was disorganized and her economy destroyed. In the North, the industrial giant created by the war turned to creating the goods of peace and expansion. The people paused to mourn and revere the memory of Lincoln. And Congress and the new president fought over who would handle the problem of reconstruction and how it would be handled. And Frederick Douglass became a man of national affairs. He assisted the freedmen in their search for economic security education, and the rights of citizens. Many naive people optimistically call the early years of Reconstruction the Negro's Hour, and Douglas was often called upon to forecast the future of his race. In 1866, he answered the question thusly. It is quite impossible at this early date to say with any decided emphasis what the future of the colored people will be. As I have often said before, we should not measure the Negro from the heights which the white race has attained, but from the depths from which he has come. On April 14, 1876, Douglas spoke at the dedication ceremonies for the Freedmen's Memorial Monument to Abraham Lincoln. Of Lincoln and the Negro people, he said, We, the colored people, newly emancipated and rejoicing in our blood-bought freedom, have unveiled and dedicated a monument of enduring granite and bronze, in which men may read something of the exalted character and great works of Abraham Lincoln. In the late 1870s, the condition of the Negro became steadily worse, and many people wondered whether he could survive in the South. It was at this time that Richard T. Greener, Harvard's first Negro graduate and dean of the law school of Howard University, joined the chorus of Negro leaders who advocated the Negro's exodus from the South to the North. PBS Pinchback and Blanche K. Bruce, well-known Negro legislators, opposed this movement. However, the most powerful voice in opposition was that of Douglas. The advocacy of a general stampede of the colored people from the South to the North is necessarily an abandonment of the great and paramount principle of protection to person and property in every state of the Union. It is an evasion of a solemn obligation and duty. The business of this nation is to protect its citizens where they are, not to transport them where they will not need protection. The best that can be said of this exodus in this respect is that it is an attempt to climb up some other than right way. It is an expedient, a halfway measure and tends to weaken in the public mind a sense of the absolute right, power, and duty of the government. During the days of the Roman Republic, there was an official called the Tribune. The Tribune's primary duty was to be eternally vigilant and to protect the rights of the poor. Douglas was a Tribune of his people, in 1883, he was bitterly disappointed because the U.S. Supreme Court had declared the Civil Rights Act of 1875 unconstitutional. At a mass meeting held at Lincoln Hall on October 23, 1883, in the nation's capital, Douglas counseled, It is said that this decision will make no difference in the treatment of colored people, that the Civil Rights Bill was a dead letter and could not be enforced. There is some truth in all this, but it is not the whole truth. That bill, like all advanced legislation, was a banner on the outer wall of American liberty, a noble moral standard uplifted for the education of the American people. This law, though dead, did speak. It expressed the sentiment of justice and fair play common to every honest heart. Its voice was against popular prejudice and meanness. 
It appealed to all the noble and patriotic instincts of the American people. It told the American people that they were all equal before the law, that they belonged to a common country, and they were equal citizens. Through the post-war years, Douglas became an admired elder statesman. His public service record was to be respected. He had served as president of the Freedmen's Bank, had been an advisor to presidents, and was an important figure in the Republican Party. Douglas had also served his country as United States Marshal for the District of Columbia and Minister to Haiti. Of the many tributes paid to this great man, the one which sums up his life best states, As an advocate of civil rights, Frederick Douglass stands outside mere race lines and places himself upon the broad basis of humanity. Going home, going home, I'm a going home. Quiet like some still day, I'm just going. On February 20th of 1895, the great voice of Frederick Douglass was stilled. He boarded the heavenly train and followed his beloved North Star. The Douglas years represented an era of contrasts. It was an era of sorrow. It was an era of joy. It was a time of peace. It was a time of conflict. The immortal Douglas will be remembered as many things. Slave, abolitionist, statesman. But above all, as Frederick Douglas, the man.